Thank you. How important is the altar experience? Does it matter that people return to the altar at your church? How much value do we place on the seeker's experience? These are important questions. And I've been tasked today with speaking on altar working tips and etiquette. And I hope to answer some of these questions for you and provide some other insights just to ponder, to think about. My wife and I have had the wonderful privilege of traveling this great fellowship as full-time evangelists for almost 12 years. During that time, we were in a lot of altar services. We witnessed the good, the not so good, the really weird, and the what is going on over there moments. So let's talk about altar etiquette. A young evangelist was once holding a revival in Gilbert, Louisiana. A lady came up to the altar and she was brand new and this young and excited evangelist rushed over to her. She had her eyes closed and her hands raised. He went into harvest mode and was about to declare some things over her when a still small voice rang out Speak with her and see why she's praying. This broke the evangelist's protocol. He hesitated for a minute. Then he followed the instruction. And when he engaged with her, she opened her eyes and put her hands down. And the evangelist thought to himself, way to go, loser. There goes that. He hesitated and then he asked the woman, he said, how can I help you pray today? Tears immediately came to her eyes and started rolling down her cheek. And she cried out and she said, I'm an alcoholic. Immediately following this confession, repentance ensued. And within moments following her confession and repentance, she was filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. You may have guessed it, but that young, powerful, and strikingly handsome evangelist was me. That was not supposed to be funny. That day, God taught me a valuable lesson that I will never forget. You don't have to discern what a willing person will make known. Communication. Let's be honest. When we are ambitious in the altar, it's possible that we press the need for a spiritual gift, such as discernment, to be used when it may not be needed. Let's not forget the words of James, and it's already been said once today. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. By simply asking the seeker a question, their need can be made known. And you have assisted them in the act of confession. And often this will lead them to repentance. We don't have to guess about the things a seeker needs to confess and repent of. It's okay to ask questions and then pray with understanding along with them. So let me say a couple of things to you today. Sometimes at our best... We can overgeneralize and overspiritualize. I've noticed another habit employed during altar work that I personally believe is not good etiquette. At times, we either overgeneralize or we overspiritualize. Let me explain what I mean by that. When we overgeneralize, it's usually using generic terminology, overused cliches. Oh, Lord, bless Bob. Help, Bob. You see, Bob. You know, Bob. Oh, God, help, Bob. Bless Bob abundantly. Or on the other side, if you'll embrace me for a moment, over-spiritualizing may sound like this. Thunderous God above. 
You see Bob and all the devils that have him bound. He's depressed, oppressed, needs deliverance, needs healing, needs restoration, needs strength. The enemy has attacked him mentally, physically, literally, emotionally, metaphorically. (laughs) Deliver Bob from all the forces of darkness. (sighs) Meanwhile, Bob may have just wanted to see what would happen if he walked up to the altar. (laughs) So how do we apply great wisdom and discernment with altar etiquette? Let me say this. If you do not know the seeker, introduce yourself. Ask if you can pray with them. Are there any specific needs that I can join with you about. If people are comfortable sharing their need with you, you don't have to guess or discern it. Asking will get you a clear and firm answer most of the time. And, and, and this is some big advice that I, I want to give you today. No matter your agenda or your thoughts, your guess, a person is coming to the altar with their own motivations. So we need to be sure that we are led by the Spirit. Don't hijack someone, someone's experience because of your spiritual impulse. If you want them to build a routine connection at the altar, consider the long-term ramifications of their initial experience. Their need, folks, their need drives the encounter. And God cares about their need. God cares about our needs. God cares about their personal needs, and so should we. Of course, of course, we want to see them experience salvation. But they must be drawn toward realizing that need for themselves. Their needs drove them to the altar toward an encounter with Christ. And we are called to support that and serve them in a way God is moving. You know, I've I've noticed that we use the phrase working the altar a lot, even in this session. But it's helpful to rephrase that, I believe, and say serve in the altar. So we can look at it from two different ways, working the altar or serving in the altar. So this begs the question, is your motivation for the seekers need to be met, or do you have an agenda that must be satisfied? When we identify what we do in the altar as work, we may lock ourselves into a predetermined list of tasks. When we identify that we are serving, or as serving, we are more likely to slow down and assess the specific needs, how the Spirit is moving, and adjust our Actions to the need at hand. Bad decisions. This is what James Collins said. Bad decisions made with good intentions are still bad decisions. Even when the ambition is considered noble, your agenda can conflict with God's work. Let me say it to you this way. While you're prepared to cast out legion, the individual coming to the altar may be gripped by the claws of grief. They may need consoling and to experience a gentle touch of the Spirit. The altar must be a place where someone can come and connect with God without feeling like they or their situation has been hijacked by us. Impulse will say, it might be their last time. Wisdom says, I don't want to be the reason for that. Your agenda should follow the Spirit. Your agenda should follow the Spirit. And we should never, ever interrupt repentance. Don't ever stop someone from repenting. 
Let them repent for as long as it takes. And it may be multiple services. We want people to be full of the Holy Ghost, but an unrepented person cannot receive His Spirit. So what I'm saying to us today, we've got to learn to serve in the altar. Do not dominate. Yield. Do not demand submission to yourself or your agenda. Final thoughts. We should look at the altar as a farmer looks at a field. Cultivate, plant, nourish, and be careful not to step on someone's progress. I'm going to be very careful and and slow in saying this to you today. It may look like only a few feet from the pew, but you don't know their full journey. You saw the few steps taken to the altar, but you don't know the many steps taken in life to arrive at a point that they can walk in our church and then have the courage to come to the altar. You cannot see how much sowing and cultivating by others it took to get them there. It might have taken years for this person to find the church and find the altar. And we don't want a few seconds of not being spirit-led to unravel it all. Don't work the altar. Serve. In the altar. Support the process that's already underway. Be led by the Spirit. So let's review. Let's review a do and don't list to conclude. I call this, and I thank my wife for helping with this today, the Chester's top five don'ts for serving the altar. Number one. No bad breath. Powerful, isn't it? Good breath is necessary. No matter how powerful you are, you will not overcome having bad. I'm just saying it. I'm just going to say it out loud. Bad breath. If you've got bad breath or somebody tells you you have bad breath, leave the altar immediately and seek a mint. I'm serious. If no one has one, leave and go to a store. If they're out at the store, go to the next town and try to find If they're out there, order it on Prime and sit at home for three days and wait for it and then come back to the office. It's important. I'm kidding, not kidding, kind of kidding. You know what I mean. Number two, assist, don't assault. Assist, don't assault. Don't pound or slap a seeker on the back, arms, shoulders, or anywhere else. I have seen moves that would have drawn an unnecessary roughness flag in the NFL. Sometimes I wish pastors had those flags. You know, flag! Oh, wait, whoa, slow down there, bud. I've cracked myself up here. Don't, number three, don't tap on someone's mouth. Smile, I'm just saying it, just saying it. Don't tap someone's mouth, don't shake someone's mouth or touch their throat. The Spirit gives the utterance, not your shaking hand. I'm going to say this and move on. Seriously, stop it. Don't do that. Don't stop. Stop. Just stop. If you can't stop, seek help. Maybe they'll help you to stop. Number four, don't mess up the seeker's hair or clothing. These are things I'm giving you. The Holy Ghost cannot be shaken in, and you cannot wrestle the devil out. Listen to me. If God decides to humble them in some way, it's up to him and not us. Number five. Don't force a spiritual experience if someone's not hungry or thirsty. Those that hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. 
You can have the greatest gifts and salesmanship. But if they're not hungry, they're not being filled. Your anointing will never compensate for their lack of holy pursuit. And so here are three things you can do while serving the altar that I believe will make an immediate impact. Number one, be humble. As Beth Baus has taught us, we can follow John the Baptist in saying, I am not the Christ. Remind yourself that you're not the solution they need, but you know the God who is. Number two, be compassionate. How often the scripture lets us know that Jesus was moved with compassion and then met someone's need. If we move and follow the Spirit and be moved with compassion, our efforts can join with the Spirit and affect those with whom we pray. 1 Peter 4 and 10, a very important scripture for this talk. As every man hath received the gift even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. The using of God's gift should honor and never dishonor. We are to minister and use our gift as good stewards. I leave you today with the most important advice I can identify scripturally for how to serve in the altar. You've already heard this reference numerous times throughout this talk, but I cannot say it enough through emphasis. Be led by the Spirit. Be led by the Spirit. Read Romans 8 to refresh your mind on how important it is to be full of and led by the Spirit. According to verse 14, your identity as a son of God is dependent on being led by the Spirit of God. So how can we know? Pastor, how can we know that we are being Spirit-led? This is not to be measured by how your emotions feel while you're praying with others. Galatians 5 lists the fruit of the Spirit. If you are being led by the Spirit while serving in the altar, you will produce the fruit of the Spirit in your interaction with the seeker. Love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. If a seeker encounters all of these wonderful things while feeling the touch of the Spirit for themselves, you can be confident that you are correctly and faithfully doing your job as an altar worker or altar server. And the seeker will be highly motivated to come right back to that altar again. God bless you.